you, Father in heaven. We thank you for your word, Father. We thank you that it's a lamp to our feet, that it's a light to our path, Father, that it shows us your truth, Father. It shows us your love. It shows us how to be your disciples. And we pray, Father, that tonight as we look into your word, Father, that our spiritual eyes and ears will be open, that the Holy Spirit will be our teacher, that we'll hear, that we'll understand, that we'll put into practice the things that we've heard, Father. And we thank you for leading us and guiding us into truth. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 We are going to start off in Matthew 11, where we've started for the last few weeks. Matthew 11, starting at verse 28, the foundation scripture. And it says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And we're going to briefly review some things before we finish up tonight. We know that the first thing Jesus said was to come to him. And there is no peace unless you come to the Father through Jesus. Peace is a fruit of the Spirit and it's found by experiencing his presence. If you're going to have peace every day, you must take time to experience his presence through prayer and worship every day. And I believe it was Brother Copeland who said, the memory of a potato doesn't nourish anyone. And that's pretty profound. The memory of a potato doesn't nourish anyone. He's talking about the need to be with the Lord every day. <coughs> Isaiah 26.3 says, you will keep him in perfect peace. His mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Those who trust in the Lord and those who wait on the Lord, and waiting on the Lord means spending time in his presence, they're the ones, Isaiah said, who will run and not be weary and walk and not faint. And as we talked about having peace every day, it's important to know that peace is not the absence of trouble, although that is a part of peace, but peace is being at rest no matter what the circumstances around you are, whether they're good or whether they're bad. It doesn't matter what they look like. We have peace when things are tranquil and we have peace when things are turbulent. We have peace because we trust God and His saving power. And that's what makes the peace that we have every day. And a couple of things we learned about being at rest um, from Hebrews 3 and 4. There is no rest for people who are rebellious. And remember, rebellion is people who have set themselves and made a determination not to follow the word of God. There's also no rest for people who are disobedient. And to be disobedient means that people know what God (coughs) wants them to do, but they're not doing it for whatever reason. There's no rest for people who are in unbelief, people who won't trust God to keep his word. And we also learn from Hebrews that the people who do enter into rest are people who mix the word with faith. They stop doing their own works and let God work, and they're diligent and persistent. And for doing all this, they receive God's word manifested in their lives. And then we also saw where he says, take my yoke upon you. A yoke is something, there are people, there are yokes for people, and it's something that helps you to carry more than you could otherwise. A yoke helps you to carry things. And really, take my yoke upon you is God offering to walk with you and make you stronger than you can be by yourself, able to do more than you can do by yourself. We have to take his yoke or his purpose on. He said for us to take it because he won't put it on us. We are going to have to take it up and then learn from him. And one of the things, one of the important things we said we need to learn from Matthew 6, 34, it's a principle of walking with God, and that verse says, sufficient for each day is its own trouble. 
We need to keep ourselves in the present in order to have peace, not in the past and not in the future. And last week we talked about the fact that the only way to deal with the past is forgiveness. We saw the importance of forgiveness in scripture last week. If you want to be forgiven, if you want to have your prayers answered, you must forgive. It really is that important. We must forgive the wrongs that have been done to us. And we can't get into unforgiveness about the wrongs that have been done to others. We can't take up offense either for ourselves or for some other person. And I said that symptoms of unforgiveness, if you get angry when you see someone or hear their name mentioned, you might have a problem. But here's some other symptoms that people may experience and not know why. Prayers not being answered. Forgiveness is always tied in with every teaching Jesus did on prayer. Also an inability to experience God's presence. And we said last week, we started talking about the fact that people can also get into unforgiveness about unmet expectations. Things you think that people ought to be doing that they are not doing. And that's where we're going to pick up today. I was going to leave it alone, but we're going to go back to that. So let's look at Romans 12, 18. Because it seems like a lot of times there is just as much unforgiveness, if not more, around unmet expectations than there is about things that were actually done that were hurtful. And so Romans twelve eighteen. Romans twelve eighteen says If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. And one of the ways that makes it possible with regards to expectations is don't expect too much. Don't expect too much from people. Do your pulling from God. Because there is a way out of this type of unforgiveness, really, and the problems that it causes. Don't expect more than what people can give. Don't allow yourself or tell yourself that they should be doing this or that. Be grateful for what people are doing instead of upset about what they're not doing. And in this, we need to be thoughtful, shall we say, we won't say careful, but thoughtful about modern psychology. I took several psychology courses in college, and as soon as I graduated, the Holy Spirit let me know that in order to walk in the Spirit, I was going to have to let that stuff go. And it's the same for everybody today, and the more you know of it, the more you realize you're going to have to let some of that go because it's very humanistic and you can either walk in the flesh, it's very mind oriented, you can either walk in the flesh or you can walk in the spirit. We all know it's better to walk in the spirit, there's more victory there. But we're going to have to let some of that go. Because in regards to unmet expectations, you know mentally ill people Whatever they have, there's one thing they all have in common. You know what it is? They're all selfish. Who are they looking at? Who are they looking at? Who are they concerned with themselves? They go to doctors every week, and or psychologists who aren't really doctors, and what do they talk about? Themselves. What do they talk about? Their feelings. We're not supposed to be living by our feelings, whatever they are. We're not supposed to be. And some psychologists, they get really into that, about how you feel and getting in touch with your feelings. It's really not necessary to be in touch with your feelings. It's necessary to be in touch with the Spirit of God. Because a lot of times people's feelings cause them to do things that are flat out wrong and hurtful just because they felt like it and they just followed the urge. We don't want to be people 
that walk by our feelings. And but one way not to get hurt is to not expect too much from people because there's a lot of unforgiveness that goes on around that. You know, God's love is never selfish. And I'm going to read First Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, but I'm going to read it from the Amplified Version. And so that says, Love endures long and is patient and kind. Love never is envious nor boils over with jealousy, is not boastful or vainglorious, does not display itself haughtily, it is not conceited, arrogant, and inflated with pride, it is not rude, unmannerly, and does not act unbecomingly. Love, God's love in us, does not insist on its own rights or its own way, for it is not self-seeking, it is not touchy or fretful or resentful, all symptoms of unforgiveness. It takes no account of the evil done to it. It pays no attention to a suffered wrong. It does not rejoice at injustice and unrighteousness, but rejoices when right and truth prevail. Love bears up under anything and everything that comes, is ever ready to believe the best of every person. Its hopes are fadeless under all circumstances, and it endures everything without weakening. Love never fails, never fades out, or becomes obsolete, or comes to an end. So God's love, as it's been expounded and pulled apart in this, in this chapter, it's all about your heart attitude, right? And it's about how you treat other people. Does it have anything to do with how they treat you? No, it doesn't. We're going to turn to John chapter 15, starting at verse 9. There's nowhere in the Bible where you can successfully live and walk, by, walk with God by acting on your feelings or by letting them run your life. First John chapter, or no, John, the Gospel of John chapter 15 starting at verse 9. It says, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. You know, there's a principle in the earth. If you serve others and meet their needs, which is what love is, isn't it? Serving others, laying down your life for others. If you do that, your needs will also be met. If you walk in love, because that's sowing and reaping. If you're out there looking for someone to meet your needs, has anybody found out that that's, you won't be real successful with that? If you're in a relationship and you're depending on somebody else to meet all your needs, is that going to work? No, it doesn't work. That's why there's so much unforgiveness around unmet expectations because people are expecting things that aren't happening and they get upset. And a lot of times, the closer the relationship, the more that can happen. Most people are all about themselves, especially worldly people, and they frequently fail to take notice of anyone else. But God's one commandment is to love others. And Jesus said the law was summed up by loving God and loving others. And we can more easily walk in forgiveness and in the present if we choose to let go of our expectations and pull on God instead. And that means not keeping a record of what's happened and just letting it go. I know that my mom shared this before. I didn't see it, but I believe she saw it. My grandmother her mother had a bit of a problem with forgiveness. 
she had a list and, and she before she went she started having dementia a little bit so she wrote everything down she had a list of every time people had called her or hadn't called her of what they'd done for her gifts that were given she was keeping a list so that she I don't know wouldn't forget to be you know to be unforgiving but she had these lists but a lot of people they won't write it down like she did but so you'll keep it in your head and when something happens it calls us up it calls up another thing that happened and then another thing that happened and then another thing so even though it was awful that my grandmother kept a notebook on it we don't want to keep that list in our heads either sufficient for each day is its own trouble let it go and start over again no record keeping of people's wrongs live in today and let tomorrow take care of itself do everything you can today instead and then move on another way that we need to learn as far as with forgiveness how to get along with people live for God instead of trying to please people you can't please most of them anyway it's better to stop trying because that causes a lot of unforgiveness if you're living to please people and then they don't show the accolades that you think they should what happens people get resentful they get upset we don't we need to live for God instead when you're doing something to please someone else or to get recognition you get no reward beyond the praise of men let's turn to Matthew chapter 6 there really is no reward for living to please other people especially at the expense of pleasing God <coughs> Matthew chapter 6 starting at verse 1 Matthew 6 1 it says take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them otherwise you have no reward from your father in heaven therefore when you do a charitable deed do not sound the trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may have glory from men assuredly I say to you they have their reward but when you do a charitable deed do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing that your charitable deed may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly and then I want to jump down to verses 19 and 20 it says do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal one way to stay in forgiveness is to please God live to please God and, and not to please people because they won't always be pleased anyway the quickest way out of peace is living to please people let's turn to Acts chapter 4 we're going to see an example of this Acts chapter 4 starting at verse 5 and remember walking in love and forgiveness is pleasing God it's the one command that he gave us Acts chapter 4 starting at verse 5 this was after Peter and John had been arrested because the lame man had <coughs> walked and they were brought before the ruler Acts chapter 4 verse 5 it says and it came to pass on the next day that their rulers elders and scribes as well as Annas the high priest Caiaphas John and Alexander and as many as were of the family of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem and when they had set them in the midst they asked by what power or by what name have you done this then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit said to them rulers of the people and elders of Israel if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man by what means he has been made well let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel 
that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For indeed that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them, that from now on they speak to no man in this name. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. This is a question worthy of contemplation. Is it better to listen to people more than God? What's the obvious answer to that? The answer is no, isn't it? It's not better. The understood answer is no. But many people who struggle in relationships are people who are living and trying to please other people. And that can drive people crazy, and there's no reward in that at the end of the day, right? If we're living to please people, there's no reward from God. We need to live to please God. Another thing, of course, that can cause you to struggle in relationships is living for yourself. But sometimes living for other people and trying to meet their expectations is a big part of unforgiveness. If you live to please God, and if you love God, you will love people. And remember what we read in Corinthians, that love is about doing what's best for them, not what's convenient for you. Everyone who's had a baby to care for knows this. Some people look forward with great delight to the day that a child can do some things for themselves. But we can't lose sight of the fact that to love people is to serve them and not to please ourselves. And that service will take a different form from midnight feedings and inconvenient diaper changes. That won't last forever, but it shouldn't stop. Serving other people is something that can't stop. We need to set our expectations on God and on His Word and look to Him to meet our needs, and we need to serve others. Matthew 6.33 says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. You will have what you need. And if you're not looking so hard at other people, it will be much easier to walk in forgiveness and to let the past go. Because forgiveness is the only way to deal with the past. Like I said last week, you can't change it. You can't take it back. You can only ask for forgiveness and move forward and move on with God. You will have many less opportunities for unforgiveness if you look to God to meet your needs instead of looking to people, instead of living to please them. Now the next thing we need to talk about, we can't live in the past. Because remember, the overarching principle here is sufficient for the day is its own trouble. That's how we need to live in the present every day. But we also can't live in the future and have peace today. Now, along the same lines as unforgiveness, where does we all know that that can lead to resentment and even to vengeance? Can it? People taking revenge for what happened. But sowing and reaping is still alive and well in the earth today. So you don't have to take up your cause. You can let God take it up. And you can walk on and do good. Let's turn back to Romans chapter 12 for this.
it's a wonderful chapter and ironically for every psychology class that we took in college because it was a Christian college they made us memorize chapters of scripture and Romans 12 was one that they made us memorize it's a good one. Romans chapter 12, we're going to start at verse 9. Romans chapter 12, starting at verse 9. It says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink, for in so doing you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Amen. That is how you live in peace. You leave it up to God, because like I said, sowing and reaping is still around in the earth today. If you go out and you act mean to people and you take revenge, what's going to happen to you? It's coming back. If we don't sow it, we don't reap it. But if we plant it in the ground, what happens? It comes back. That's why, that is part of the reason why the Lord does say to walk in love. No matter what's done to you, walk in love. You don't want to start sowing bad because if you do, you're going to reap bad. That's the way that's the way it works. And we're going to compare this to Matthew chapter 5, and this was Jesus talking. That was Paul. This is Jesus. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. Where Jesus said the same thing. And remember, sowing and reaping is a big part of the reason why he said this. Matthew 5, 43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spite use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore you shall be perfect or mature, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Because sowing and reaping is alive and well in the earth, only so good. And this is that scripture I referred to last week. Praying for someone is a good way to get rid of unforgiveness. It works every time and we do not want to be unforgiving so we should not be doing that walking out on forgiveness and taking vengeance there's another form of living in the future and that's worry worry is a form of living in the future instead of the present because it really is fear of the future it's fear of something that hasn't happened yet and that's why it will always rob you of peace. Now some studies done in 20, 2019 showed that people in general spend 26% of their thinking time each day worrying. 
and the definition of worry being afraid of something that hasn't happened yet that may not ever happen and they also prove that 91 percent of the time what people wor are worried about does not happen so we're living in useless fear when we worry and we're allowing that fear to stop us from living today so we're going to read some scriptures about worry we'll flip back over to Matthew 6 this time we're going to start in verse verse 25 Matthew 6 25 it says therefore I say to you do not worry about your life what you will eat or what you will drink nor about your body what you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing look at the birds of the air for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns yet your Heavenly Father feeds them are you not of more value than they which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature so why do you worry about clothing consider the lilies of the field how they grow they neither toil nor spin and yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these now if God so clothes the grass of the field which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven will he not much more clothe you O you of little faith therefore do not worry saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear for after all these things the Gentiles speak for your Heavenly Father knows that you need all these things but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you one of the common things that people worry about is things or needs being met but has God already provi promised to provide for us yes. he has is he always on time he is and he always makes sure that everything we need is in place when we get there and as Jesus said is worrying going to change that for the better no when we're worrying we need to take a step back and think about what we're really doing are we trying to figure out a way to meet our own needs without God are we looking to ourselves to provide and to do or are we waiting on the Lord if we wait on the Lord we can be in peace now I want to flip over to another interesting one in Matthew 10 it's brief Matthew 10 verses 19 and 20 and this was talking about being delivered and having to make an answer before people Matthew 10 19 20 it says but when they deliver you up do not worry about how or what you should speak for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak for it is not you who speak but the spirit of your father who speaks in you how much time do people spend worrying about what to say or what to do in a given situation and when you get there do you end up really doing or saying what you thought or even hoped you would not usually what he's saying here it's better to let the spirit guide your tongue now that one does take some faith this does take faith but it's better to let the spirit answer through you than to spend time worrying about what you're going to say and I want to flip over to Psalm 37 because this has applications about Psalm 37 about worrying and fretting Psalm 37 we'll read some of this but we'll start at verse 1 it says do not fret because of evildoers nor be envious of the workers of iniquity for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb trust in the Lord and do good 
Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it only causes harm. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. And it goes on to talk about the difference between the righteous and the wicked. But there are reasons not to fret. Do not fret because of evildoers. Trust in the Lord. That's what it's saying there. Trust in the Lord to protect and to provide for you all the days of your life. Remember, worry is expecting bad things to happen. Trust God and expect good instead. Expect his word instead. Take his yoke and you will find rest for your soul, for your mind, your will, and your emotions. Because aren't these the very things that rob people of peace? Spreading over evildoers, over everything that's going wrong. Don't let it. Trust the Lord instead. That's what that psalm is saying. Live for today because if you have everything you need for today, you have enough. And now we're going to go back and finish Matthew 11, um, 28 to 29. It just says a couple of things about the Lord that we need to take note of. The first one is that it says the Lord is gentle and lowly in heart. Let's think about what that means. God, it means that God is not pushing you. The Bible says he's patient. He's waiting for you to look to him, but he does not force people. What does this have to do with peace? If you're feeling forced, if you're feeling pushed into something, is that God? No, he doesn't push. He doesn't force. He's gentle. He's lowly in heart. These are two, and also impatience is not of God. We will need to learn to be patient. But these are two things that cause people to not have peace. If you're feeling forced or pressed to choose or to do, that's not God. He is patient. James says he waits patiently for the fruit of the earth. Now, if you tend to be an impatient person, you might chafe under his yoke a bit because God has a timetable. And he does things on his time, not our time. I'm sure that Abraham did not think that he would have to wait 25 years for Isaac to be born. But he did. He did have to. And when it happened, it was good. We need to be, that's what the psalm was saying, patient, wait, and trust in the Lord. And at the same time, speaking of God's timing, he is also a God of suddenly. Where things are going along the same, you might not like it, but it seems hard, and then suddenly something happens, and everything changes. All of a sudden, everything you've been praying for appears in an instant at the right time. Your job is to walk with him so that when the time is right, he can lead you out. But he leads, he doesn't push. And the last thing Matthew said there, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And what is that? That's an indicator. It's a warning light of sorts. Where the Lord leads, he provides. If provision seems to not be there, you might not be in the right place if you're not confident, because the Lord leads and he provides. If you're feeling, if you're feeling like you're constantly pushing, if you're feeling you're weighed down, this is an indicator. Is that yoke from God? His yoke is easy and his burden is light. It doesn't mean that you don't have to work, but it shouldn't be hard. It shouldn't be pressing. It shouldn't be forceful. 
These are things that indicate whether to us whether something is of God or not. Going back to the beginning as we finish, Jesus said the work of God, to do the work of God, we have to believe. And because I'm finishing this up tonight, remember the lesson from Exodus. In Matthew 6, 11, in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread, right? This day our daily bread. That's that concept, again, of living in today and staying in the present. Remember, when the Israelites went out to gather the manna, the Lord had said, pick up only a certain amount for each person in the house. So, did they always, and then he said on the sixth day, double it because there isn't going to be any manna on Sunday. Now, did they listen? No, no they didn't. The next day what they found out is that first day they went out and some people gathered more and tried to hide it. And what happened to it? Worms and it stank. Did it work? No. They had to go out and gather that day what they needed. And then conversely, um, the day before the Sabbath, he said go and get two portions for each person because on the Sabbath it's not coming. So. They had gotten evidently used to their daily bread and they did not, again, follow instructions. And they went out on the Sabbath to gather and, oh my, it wasn't there. The lesson, give us this day our daily bread. That's what he's talking about. Come into his presence every day. Live in the present. Live for now because God provides daily. The other thing Jesus said was, Luke 9.23, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. This is something we do every day. Peace is found by living with God every day. And we can have peace in spite of bad circumstances. And if we will walk with God every day and trust him every day, we will have peace every day because he has spoken good things to his people. He has made promises to us in his word. And as we learn from him, life gets easier and less burdensome as we take up his purposes and lay down our own. The key component is to live for today. Don't live in the past with regrets and unforgiveness. Don't live in the future with worry and fear today polluting that future. Believe the word and let God bring it to pass in your life. Don't be impatient and don't try to live on yesterday's manna. Come to him today and believe his word. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you that you are a present God. You promised us in Jesus, your Emmanuel, God with us. You are always there, and today is always the day of salvation. Today is always the day when we can see your power move, Father. Today is the day when our faith works, because faith is always now, and we thank you for it, Father. I pray that as we go throughout our week, Father, that you'll show us how to live in the present, how to stay in the present, to put the past and the future away and live with you right now and know your goodness, Father, and your love in each moment. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.